So good afternoon, everyone. Actually, good evening to Dr. Scott in Australia. Thank you, Dr. Scott, again. It's so late. My name is Christiana. I'm IBA product manager. I would like to welcome everyone for the second IBA webinar of the year. The first one was about the PSMA Disruptive Platform in Prostate Cancer Patients, which is available for you to watch at YouTube. But today, we have two leading figures in the field of nuclear medicine who will talk about radio metals in Teranosc applications, present and future perspectives. How this webinar will roll up? We have two presentations. Each presentation will take 20 minutes. The first presentation is about the current status and future directions of accelerator-produced radiometals for therapy and imaging application. And the presentation will be given by Professor Liu. Professor Liu serves as Chief of Radiochemistry and Imaging Sciences Service at Memorial Sloan Kettering, and he's the Director of MSK Radiochemistry and Molecular Imaging Probe Core Facility. He's an author of more than 250 papers, books, book chapters, etc., in the field of molecular imaging. The second presentation is about clinical applications of teranoscopies with radiometals. This presentation will be delivered by Dr. Scott. Dr. Scott is the director of the Department of Molecular Imaging and Therapy in Austin, and he is also professor of medicine at the University of Melbourne and also La Trobe University in Melbourne, Australia. So you can ask during the webinar, during the presentations, you can ask your questions. And to ask your questions, you can go to the question field. Let me show you on the screen the question field. Just a minute. So during the presentation, you can enter your questions already. OK, right there. You see, you can put your questions through the question field. And at the end of the two presentations, there will be a five-minute presentation from IBA, how to produce non-conventional isotopes, the radio metals that we will be talking about. And finally, we have the 10 minutes Q&A. OK, so I will give the control of the screen to Dr. Liu for the first presentation on current status and future directions of accelerator produced radio metals for therapy and image applications. Dr. Liu, thank you again. There we go. OK, so good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for attending this, this webinar. As mentioned, I'm Jason Lewis, and I'm at the Moral Stone Kettering Cancer Center. Um, by way of disclosure, there we go. By way of disclosure, these are all my possible disclosures. Uh, the main one, I will be talking a little bit about some agents that we had from Mavvax Therapeutics that were supplied to us. Um, and I'll be talking a little bit about that agent at the end of this seminar. So why are we actually here? Um, why are we here? Uh, cancer is a very heterogeneous disease. It is the reason why we haven't cured cancer with cisplatin 60 years ago. And for those of you who haven't read this paper, and there's a few others like this, um, even if you're not a biologist, you should totally read this paper where it demonstrates beautifully that even in a primary tumor, depending where you take that biopsy, there's a broad array of prognostic signature genes present in that biopsy, uh, present in that tumor. So if there's such heterogeneity in the primary tumor, you can imagine how heterogeneous the metastasis are. So this is really the challenge that we we are dealt with right now, and where I feel that theragnostics, imaging and diagnosis, imaging diagnosis and therapy come into play. So since I'm the first speaking today, I'm going to very much concentrate on some of how the way the, the nuclides are made and some clinical work, and then Andrew will be talking about uh, very much about the clinical applications. So first of all, let me define what a theragnostic is. Uh, this came straight out of a paper from Sean Chen that was published uh, in 2011, that a theragnostic is basically a molecular diagnostic test um, that is combined with a therapy. This all falls under the umbrella of precision medicine, personalized medicine, theragnostics, and these terms are often changed interchangeably. It can be a diagnosis that's followed up by therapy to stratify patients to respond to a given treatment. It could also be a therapy followed by diagnosis to monitor earlier response. And it's also possible that these diagnostic and therapeutics are co-developed if we think about Herceptin and Hercept test, FISH test for breast cancer. That's a theragnostic. But what we're here about today is we do the radio theragnostic. And that is when we're referring to the use of radionuclides for paired imaging and therapy. You're imaging to see the lesion, 
um, stage the lesion, how big is it, how many are there, where are they located, and then using that as a therapy to treat the same lesions. So we have, fortunately, and I'll get into this a bit later, a very broad array of isotopes that we can access in order to do radiotherapeutics. Um, iodine, of course, yttrium, terbium, copper, gallium, scandium, astatine, and so on. The goal of the radiotherapeutics are to enhance therapy efficacy. That's number one. Um, manage adverse events, improve patient outcome, and hopefully lower overall costs. So in regards to theranostics, people thinking it's a brand new term, I think everybody knows that is not the case. Um, we have been using iodine as a radiotherapeutic for many, many, many years. And um, I always want to make sure we put that historical context in place because this really has been something we've been doing for a long time. We've just been, there's just a lot more focus on it right now. So some of the examples, and I think uh, Andrew will be talking more in, in details of these about the uh, currently used or clinical development theragnostics. There was quite a few under development, but I think in terms of market, that the radiotherapeutics represents about 12 to 15 percent of the total nucleomycin market in 2016 versus 4 percent in 2013. So that's a huge jump for some reasons such as Sofigo. I really do think that this market share is going to increase. Um, We've heard numbers that expect to be more than 20% by 2020. That's unconfirmed, but I do think that if we have, um, with the potential approval of things like PSMA, that this number will be larger. So the isotopes. I am a radiochemist, so I get tremendously excited more than I should do about the periodic table. And the periodic table is both, um, in some respects, a good thing and a bad thing, where we look at the figure you have in front of you now, and we look at the available PET isotopes and SPECT isotopes, we have a huge choice of what we can do. But the disadvantage is we have a huge choice of what we can do. Um, we really do have the ability to go in and pick uh, many different isotopes for our application. And this one's loading up very slowly, but it's really just showing the available PET isotopes that we have um, to, to work with. And the important part with this is that, again, sorry, the graphic's not coming up, um, that the pet life's, the pet isotopes go from very short-lived isotopes to very long-lived isotopes. We need to be able to match the isotope with the platform we're using. So if, for example, we're doing a small molecule, it will have a behavior in the, in the body that's probably on the order of minutes to hours. If we tag that platform, which is very fast with a very long-lived isotope, we have overkill. We're giving unnecessary dosimetry to uh, healthy organs. However, if we want to look at, say, an antibody, and I'll give an example of this later, which takes days to weeks to circulate in the body, if we were to label with something short-lived, such as carbon-11 with a 20-minute half-life, then we're not going to see the full kinetics of the platform. So it's very important that when we're designing these theradiagnostic, radiotheradiagnostic platforms that we aim to match the nuclide and the radioactive half-life of the nuclide with a biological half-life of the platform, the small molecule, peptide, antibody, and nanoparticle that we want to see an image. Okay, so that gets back to the first principles I just mentioned. We have a, a huge array of molecules that we can use for delivering our isotope. We have a huge number of nuclides. Uh, we've spoiled with choice in many respects. Um, we have a large number of ways that we can attach our radio metal to the biological entity, such as a peptide or an antibody. And we have a huge array of ways of ways that we can link this together. We have an infinite number of possibilities to create radiotherapeutic agents. So I'm going to now talk mainly about obviously the radio metals, that was the context of this talk. I've listed here some of the accelerator produced radio metals, which are either copper base, scandium, technetium 94M, gallium agents, yttrium 86, and zirconium 89. As I mentioned, uh, here's just a few examples. As, as mentioned, they have half-lives that go from anything from um, an hour or minutes to an hour to uh, multiple hours to days. And they can all be produced in similar ways. They all obviously have a positron emission, allowing us to do um, PET imaging. They have a wide range of gammas we have to consider in other emissions when it comes to dosimetry. But I think this table very elegantly shows you 
just the broad array of um, half-lives, emissions, uh, oxidation chemistries, coordination numbers that you can play with in order to build a radiotheragnostic that you're building for a particular purpose. One thing that we've done in the field, I think, for many years that hasn't been the right way to do things is we've made a fabulous compound, and then the oncologists say, well, that doesn't do much good for us because these patients live 20 years anyway. So now we've had a mindset change where the oncologist is saying, I need an agent to do X, Y, and Z. And then we can build back from that clinical question and start developing the agents to answer that question. And we had the ability to pick an isotope that matches the platform that we've used for that problem. Radio metals can be produced other means as well as accelerators. There's also generators, which is the main source of gallium 68. Uh, protons I mentioned for making things like copper 64, zirconium 89, um, neutrum 86, technetium 94M. Also, nuclear reactors are very important when it comes to production of isotopes, um, in particular therapeutic isotopes. Um, that's, you know, lutetium 177 as a no carry added from euterbium, I think is one that's in most people's minds right now. And then of course, the production of a photonuclear reaction for producing um, isotopes such as copper 67. And I'll talk a bit more about copper 67 later. So I'm gonna talk first about really just two examples. There are so many examples I can talk about here in regards to making isotopes. But I'm gonna talk a little bit about copper 64 first and how we make that just as an example of how we make a positron emitting nuclide on a psychotron and the kind of things that we go through in order to make it into a pure and usable form. If we go to this slide here, we can take on the top right here, we have a nickel target that we have plated into it, nickel 64, and then using the PN reaction, we can take nickel 64, put protons on, out comes a neutron, and we can make copper 64. Using the same reaction and the same methodology, you can make copper 60, copper 61, and copper 64. So once it's irradiated, of course, we have to then isolate this copper 64 because we're only having a tiny, tiny amount of copper 64 that's present in the nickel. We don't convert all the nickel to copper. So it has to be purified, and this can be done by simple ion exchange chromatography. There are automated systems to do this now. Um, when I used to do it, I used to do it by hand, but nowadays it all can be automated. And you can isolate the copper 64 in high yields and high specific activity. This is very important. You don't want to have a system that you don't have the ability to make large amounts of the isotope so that you have a patient on the table, you're able to deliver what you need, but you also have a clean enough product that you're able to label efficiently the platform which you're using to take your copper uh, to, to, its, to its target. What's also important is that many of these materials, such as nickel 64, are enriched and are very expensive. So you have to have a recycling system in order to reclaim this nickel 64 um, and be able to re-irradiate it to make more copper 64 in the future. Um, with copper 64, they, this is just a small sample of chelates that you have uh, to deliver the copper 64 onto the antibody or peptide. Um, Everybody needs to remember that when we look at a PET image or a nuclear medicine image of some kind, we are not looking at the fate necessarily of the antibody of the peptide. We're looking at the ultimate fate of the nuclide. So we have to make sure that the nuclide, when it's attached to a peptide or an antibody, stays with it. We're not imaging the antibody, we're imaging the, the isotope. So we have to make sure these two things stay together. And by achieving that, we have macrocyclic chelated chemistry where we have the ability to hold in the center of these chelates copper 64 very stably and using some methodology such as a linker here to attach it to the, the peptide or the antibody. And we have a huge choice of copper chelators and you can look at works of people like Carolyn Anderson who has spent, uh, who have done phenomenal work and spent their entire careers looking at um, wonderful chelators for copper. Uh, so Conium 89 is the other isotope I'm gonna briefly just uh, talk about how we make that um, because it's somewhat of the opposite spectrum of copper 64. Copper 64 has a 12 hour half-life so it matches very nicely with peptides um, but if you want to do an antibody copper 64 may not be quite long enough in half-life in order to see the biological behavior of the antibody but zirconium 89 has a half-life of 78 minutes so it's somewhat ideally ideally solute, um, 
ideally situated for Salau to image antibodies. We make this from a Utrum 89 target, and in this case, it's actually cheap because it's 100% abundant. And then we can, on a cycadron, do the same PN reaction we did with copper to produce high specific activity and, high, and highly pure zirconium-89. I just want to finish up by giving a couple of examples of what we do with these, and I thought it would be best to start off with, with peptides. Um, why do we want peptides? Well, peptides are less immunogenic for the most part than antibodies. They do behave quicker and faster than antibodies, but not as fast or as quick perhaps as a small molecule. They do have rapid clearance from the body. You are able to create these peptides and do modifications to them to increase stability and also improve clearance. And you can also uh, have the ability to couple um, all these radio metals I've spoken to onto a peptide system. When you talk about a small molecule and putting a radio metal in, unless the radio metal is the basis of that small molecule, you're generally doing a large modification to that small molecule that can um, perturb its biological behavior or worse, its receptor binding properties. So um, the peptide, the, the nuclide that's probably got the most attention right now um, with peptides is gallium-68. As with copper-64, there are a variety of chelators for gallium-68, and um, it's a really well-suited isotope for uh, theranostics just because it's got a 68-minute half-life. For those who aren't ready chemists, this is the easiest half-life to remember. It's, six, it's gallium-68, but it's 68 minutes. Um, so it's well suited for theragnostics, do quick imaging, straightforward studies. A um, lot of attention right now, obviously, on the Dota Toc, Dota Tate peptides, and uh, and they're used clinically. And I know that Andrew's going to talk about that, so I don't really want to dwell on this. But I can show you here in terms of the peptide. Here it is. This is the targeting entity, the Tate. And then with the right chelate on here, you had the ability to put into this stably gallium-68, lutetium-177, yttrium-90, you could do copper and other isotopes, but these are the ones which probably have been the most translated at this point. Ga oops, gallium-68 dotatoc, um, this is a short peptide. Uh, I, again, I, you'll hear more about this in the, in the next talk, but it's probably, um, the, oh, the reason I want to put this slide in is the fact that there obviously was OctraScan available for many years, still is, with Indium 111 as a SPECT agent, but now going to a PET agent, which allows you to quantification of this target, really allows you to tune better together the concept of having a diagnostic that's quantitative along with the therapy, the lutetium-based therapy, and doing this on a more personalized basis in patients. In regards to antibodies, we have um, Zirconium-89 and other nuclides, but I'm just going to base, really focus on Zirconium-89. This is, um, as I mentioned earlier, it's ideally matched. I want to give one example from my own laboratory, and as I mentioned, uh, Mavvax Therapeutics has supported uh, this work financially. But with an antibody system, we have biology that has done a phenomenal amount of work for us. Biology in the human body um, or have created antibodies. And antibodies are incredibly exquisite and specific entities for hitting antigens. They really do have, uh, they really are remarkable entities. Um, the problem that we have is the fact that they do take weeks to days to, to, to do the biological, um, to circulate in the, in the body and, and to clear out from the background. Um, but nevertheless, what we want to take advantage of these antibodies because of what they're able to do. But to do that, we do need zirconium-89 with the half-life that matches the biological half-life of the antibody to see how they behave. We have access to one antibody here, um, 5B1. This is a fully human antibody. And by that, it was actually isolated from a patient at MSKCC. So it wasn't created in the lab, but it, it came from a patient that has a very, very high affinity for carbohydrate and um, antigen CA99, um, this is actually just the monomer of it, There's a, it's actually a dimer, um, and this is a secreted protein uh, in human beings, CA99 that's often used for looking at uh, how, as a blood marker for looking at the presence of pancreatic cancer or how they respond to therapies, but we have an antibody that, that images this. When we look at how FDG looks in an orthotopic pancreatic cancer model. Here's the tumor here. 
here's the mouse's heart and here's its bladder, you can see that the regularly used FDG, at least in this mouse model, does not work that well. If we, however, take this 5B1 that has been chelated to the Sekonium 89 via DFO, so we have a nice stable construct here that allows us to do imaging in vivo because we can keep the Sekonium with a 5B1, and we put this into the same mouse, you very nicely delineate the orthotopic pancreatic cancer in the pancreas of the mouse, showing you immediately that this is superior to FDG, at least in mouse models. In regards to um, the next stage of doing this, I just want to show some examples of organoids, which are patient-derived uh, pancreatic cancers, but also orthotopically implanted into mice. And you can see very nicely still in these organoid systems, um, seeing that tumor very nicely. I want to put this up here because I do think that there's a lot of talk right now about using organoids in preclinical settings. I think this is perfectly appropriate. I think that they're, uh, they're going to pay their place. They are expensive, but I do I don't think they're going to replace subcutaneous models, but I do think that we'll, we will see more of these models in the future. But how does this work out when we to go to a human situation in a phase one safety trial? Um, zirconium 5P1, as I showed was in mouse earlier, but it's also known as MVT. This is Mavax 2163. Um, how does this work in humans? You can see here a patient who has metastatic pancreatic cancer. Um, and this is the first imaging time point. You can see the zirconium-89 antibody that's still in the blood system because it's still circulating. You're able to start delineating some tumors. As you go to the right over time, more of the activity clears out of the blood system. Um, and at the end point here, we have a five-day imaging time point. And imaging the source of CA99 pancreatic cancers, you can very nicely see metastatic pancreatic cancer in the liver of this patient, as well as some involvement in a node up here in the thoracic region. So this is allowing us to really see the extent of this patient's pancreatic cancer extremely well. But if we want to go to the next stage, then of course it's about radiotheragnostics. So even though we have shown this very nicely in mouse models to image mice, and in humans, we can see liver metastasis from pancreatic cancer. Because we have this antibody, we can now change out the diagnostic zirconium-89 and put a therapeutic in. And that's exactly what we've done, followed some successful preclinical studies. We're now doing new TCM-177 for the antibody. And just because um, we're doing that doesn't mean we're going to stop there. We have the ability to also to change out with actinium to use an alpha-emitting isotope on this 5B1, and that's now at preclinical stages, um, and also develop some other chemistries that trying to take advantage of the beautiful selectivity, exclusivity of 5B1 for pancreatic cancer, but having to wait five days, trying some pre-targeting methodology to allow us to inject the antibody, send the patient home, wait a week, and then inject a small molecule radioactive portion that finds that antibody still and imaging this antibody with F18. And we're hoping this will be in patients by the end of the year or Gallium 68. So this is taking something from the diagnostic to therapeutic. So um, this really, I think, is a good example of a radiotheragnostic th paradigm. So I'm almost at the end. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about future perspectives. Um, and I kind of asked a few people about this, about what were the future perspectives would be. Well, for many years, for example, copper 67 has been an isotope we've all wanted more of, and we had it available many years ago. And we've all known it has huge potential, um, but availability has been the issue. But I think now that it, that is being solved, and I'm very happy to see that that is somewhat being solved. Um, of course, having the ability of copper 67, a beta emitter uh, for therapy, paired with a positron emitter such as copper 64 or copper 62 or copper 61 or copper 60 is a really nice uh, radiotheragnostic pairing. Um, and I do think we really do need another beta nuclide in the arsenal for people like uh, uh, Andrew to, to use in patients. Actinium-225, everybody is becoming, well, everybody is very impressed by the PSMA data that's coming out with actinium from, from Europe and South Africa. I do believe this will become more widely available. Kathy Cutler at Brookhaven, at Brookhaven um, and her team uh, are really working on um, making this and 
the DOE in general and making this more available. There are all the other sources, and I do think this will be more available in com coming years. Um, I do think that some of this will be driven by major pharmaceutical companies. Um, they do need to continue to evaluate the saf safety and efficacy of this before they bring it to market. And I do think we need to get some more I more of a handle on the long-term toxicity from actinium-225. The profound responses we're seeing in these patients are amazing, but I do think we need to really think about what is the long-term toxicity, and have we really begun to understand that yet? I think, I hope it's gonna be okay, but I just think it's, I wanna throw that out there. Um, Scandium-44, um, sorry, acetine-211, uh, still limited availability due to the very limited number of medium energy psychotrons with the alpha beam capability. We do definitely need more chelators for this, and I know that people are working in that area, and hopefully we will start seeing some new chelators and, and more work for acetine. Um, it'll also keep uh, Professor Mike Zalitsky at Duke happy if we if we have more adoption of acetine. So conium-18, uh, scandium-44, I do not think it will replace scandium-68, but it may complement it. Unlike gallium-68, the long half-life does allow for dosimetry estimation or better dosimetry estimation prior to lutetium-177. This allows, therefore, a more personalized medicine approach. Um, the widespread adoption and clinical utility has to be tested in clinical trials. I was in a meeting last week, and I was beginning to see a lot of this coming out and trials being done. It's very exciting, um, and I think that is where we're gonna have some, some use. The disadvantage is the high gammas, and so we have to look very carefully at exposure to the patients, the staff and the patients. And I didn't put it here, but Scandium 43 is pretty much the same as Scandium 44, but without the high gammas. Um, the only problem is you can only make about 10 millicuries in a low energy medical cyclotron. Um, you can make more in an alpha, but it's definitely worth exploring and seeing if there's ways that we can improve that. Finally, um, the, the final slide on future perspectives are um, we need to make sure that we're always asking the right clinical question. And then those of us as radiochemists are building the right tool to be deployed um, to answer it. So the major drivers for, our, for the nuclide are making sure we have the right clinical application, but it's also going to be cost effective. Is that nuclide going to be available? Is there going to be reproducibility? If you're doing a theragnostic and you're doing, say, four therapy treatments and you're unsure you're going to get that second, third or fourth treatment delivered to the clinic, that's an issue and it will not survive. So reproducibility and robust supply are huge. And as I mentioned, I think a few times, we need to make sure we match the half-life delivery platform. There is a lot of choice out there. We're spoiled for choice. So let's use the right nuclide in the right context at the right time for the right question. The level of interest is more than ever. I think with the success of Lutathera, there's more and more pharma getting opportunities. Uh, see this as an opportunity for, for more drugs. Let's not mess this up. Um, I think that we have failed in the past to perhaps really get over there, get, um, uh, get our field to the forefront of this. I think we're doing a lot of second or third line therapies with these radiothagnostics, and I think we need to really start pushing to become first line when we have approved drugs, because I, I think it'll make a profound difference. And then there are always new clinical trials, but as I said, endlessly, we want to make sure we're asking the right questions and we are doing them correctly. So with that, I hope I wasn't too long over time. Um, I'd just like to, oops, I'd just like to thank you and uh, I think we're having questions after um, Andrew's spoken. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Dr. Lewis, for this wonderful presentation. Uh, now we're going to, to the next presentation. Of course, I, I have some questions already. These questions will be addressed in the end of Dr. Scott's presentation. So hold on a little bit to get to the questions. It's gonna be after the IBA five minute presentation, okay? so. Dr. Scott, thank you again. Dr. Liu's perfect, fantastic. Dr. Stock, thank you again for your participation. So we're giving the control to you for the screen. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, and, and good evening to everyone. Um, I think we've had a wonderful uh, introduction to the, uh, the field of uh, pteridnostics with radio metals by Jason. What I'll be doing uh, in the next 20 minutes or so is talking about some of the current and, and future directions of the clinical applications of various approaches for theranostics with uh, radiometals. Okay, these are my disclosures. Sorry, we have a slight lag in the uh, uh, movement. So 
Uh, as has already been discussed, there's a very broad array of targets that we can look at both for imaging and therapy. And I think uh, in nuclear medicine, over the last five to 10 years, we've appreciated more and more that we have approaches to be able to not just image, but also deliver therapeutics to targets that are relevant to cancer. Uh, and also aid in the development of new therapeutics through molecular imaging approaches as well. And this slide really just touches on uh, really this fact. We can really focus on virtually any uh, process which occurs within the cell from uh, DNA turnover through to transcriptional regulation, the expression of lipids, proteins, metabolic pathways, and not just within the tumor cell itself, but also within the microenvironments of the tumor. And so we have a uh, a broad array of approaches that we can use for molecular imaging. Um, as we are able to select these targets, and as mentioned by Jason, uh, we then have the opportunity to think about paired theranostic approaches. And this can involve either imaging and therapy of the same target with the same moiety, or it can also be where we use our molecular imaging approaches to identify the presence of a target and assist with dose selection, patient selection, um, heterogeneity of expression and appropriateness of treatment, and also monitoring response as well. Uh, in this context, the chemical properties, mechanism of action and pharmacokinetics of the therapeutics all impact on our imaging approach. And I completely agree with Jason's comment that um, just because you can doesn't mean you should. You really have to ask the question, what is the biology of the target and the cancer that you're looking at? And what is the best way to approach that uh, when you actually decide on your imaging approach as well as therapy? As Jason mentioned, we do look at uh, the half-life to match to the um, biologic PK and behavior of the molecules that we're looking at. So that for the short-lived um, or sh uh, fast PK molecules, uh, going to peptides, we look at the shorter-lived um, radioisotopes, and this we're going up to the longer uh, half-life, such as uh, intact IgG1 antibodies, which have half-lives up to 10 days. We need to be looking at um, longer-lived uh, radionuclides as well. One of the other important areas, as I'll be touching on briefly, is cell trafficking studies, because CAR T-cell therapy, for example, was actually announced by ASCO as being the treatment of the year in 2018. And, and when we're looking at whether or not these um, uh, cell-based studies are actually trafficking to the site of tumor or to the region where the um, activation of the immune system occurs, uh, we can use copper 64 or zirconium 89 in those um, examples. And, and by using PET-based approaches, of course, that does uh, enhance our ability to perform dosimetric analysis, which is very important for selection of patients and for radionuclide selection for clinical trials as well. Probably the exemplar which you would all be familiar with uh, in the Theranostic approach is using uh, somatostatin receptor imaging. So uh, Dota Tate, Dota Toc, uh, Dota Noc, um, SSTR2, 3 and 5 receptors can be identified. Uh, Gallium 68, uh, based studies uh, are now becoming far more prevalent throughout the world. Uh, and as you can see in this example, clearly identify sites of disease which much higher resolution and greater sensitivity than um, that particular somatostatin receptor imaging agent that many of us grew up on, which was indium 111 octreotide, which is still used in some, some countries around the world. But we do know that the clinical studies have shown the greater sensitivity for sites of disease of gallium-68 based somatostatin receptor imaging agents. Uh, we also know that there's a very clear difference between the ability of uptake of these gallium-68 somatostatin receptor imaging agents in neuroendocrine tumors that have low proliferative indices uh, as compared to, to SDG. And this is again illustrated in the, the next slide where on the left hand side you can see a patient that was imaged with FDG and Dota Tate who had lesions that had a higher proliferative index as indicated by CHI-67, uh, which is an immunohistochemistry based assay, uh, where the lesions are much better seen on FDG than with Dota Tate compared to lesions that have a lower proliferative index 
uh, in the right-hand side images in a, another patient where FDG shows very little sites of disease compared to what you see with the gallium-68 dotatate. Um, so it's been well characterized, well established uh, that uh, gallium-68 somatostatin receptor imaging is a very um, accurate and very sensitive way to detect patients with neuroendocrine tumors. And this has obviously been extended into therapeutic studies. Uh, there are a range of um, trials, single site that were performed, but it was really um, the uh, phase three trial for lutetium-177 dotatate for midgut neuroendocrine tumors published last year in the New England Journal that really demonstrated, as you can see here, the marked differences in both progression-free survival as well as overall survival of the lutetium-177 dotatate compared to control that subsequently led to lutathera, as its trade name is called, approval in Europe in 2017 and in US in 2018. Now, because of this success, um, there has been um, a rapid extension of trials uh, looking at uh, lutetium-177 based therapeutics based on somatostatin receptor targeting peptides uh, in not just mid-gut tumors, but also pancreatic and gastropancreatic um, patient populations. In all of these studies, including um, the lutate-based phase three, um, the expression of somatostatin receptors with positivity on, for example, gallium-68 uh, somatostatin receptor peptide imaging as an inclusion criteria has resulted in great success. And two of the studies which are under uh, way at the moment include the Ocluridom trial and the COMPETE study, which are very large phase two and phase three trials, which are multinational and ongoing at the moment. The development of lutetium-177 based peptide therapy, as was mentioned by Jason, is now extending into a tumor type which um, has the potential to dwarf um, the numbers of patients with neuroendocrine tumors that we're seeing at the moment. And certainly uh, prostate cancer patients, metastatic castrate resistant who have positive gallium-68 PCMA uh, imaging and treated with lutetium PCMA in single site studies, uh, including this one recently published in Lancet Oncology and published by the Peter McCallum Group, have shown, as you can see in the waterfall plot on the left-hand side, significant PSA responses in this population. And on the right-hand side, disease ranging from lymph node involvement through to extensive bony metastatic disease uh, has been shown to respond and with corresponding reductions in PSA uh, in a very large proportion of patients that have been treated. In this particular study, 62% of patients had a greater than 50% PSA response. This image on the right-hand side was actually awarded the best image of the year at the SNMMI meeting in June um, in Philadelphia. So it's clear that there is huge uh, opportunities and development uh, with not just neuroendocrine tumor patients, but also PSMA-based patients. And again, the use of paired theranostics, gallium-68 PSMA is critical. Uh, a series of uh, large phase two and phase three multinational studies are occurring at the moment. This is an example of a patient who's actually on the Australian-based therapy phase two trial, uh, which is a 200 patient multi-center prospective study where patients receive FDG PET and gallium-68 PSMA to screen. You can appreciate actually in this patient who's got quite a lot of metastatic bone disease on the gallium-68 PSMA scan, some of these lesions actually do show FDG uptake, but still show very high gallium-68 PSMA uptake. Uh, but after treatment with lutetium PSMA, you can see that the excellent correlation of the sites of disease on the PSMA gallium scan with that which we can see with lutetium. So within the next um, 12 to 18 months, we will be seeing readouts from both the vision and the therapy study. Uh, and these will be the harbingers, I think, of uh, future approvals for PSMA-based compounds moving forward. So as we're thinking about the way in which we can pair these treatments together, it's, as Jason said, not just beta emitters which are becoming more, more popular. The availability of alpha emitters, including actinium-225, has increased in recent years. 
This is an example of a patient. You can see on the left-hand side the gallium PCMA scan of extensive disease, uh, both retroperitoneal as well as in the mediastinum and left supraclavicular region, treated with actinium PCMA with quite a remarkable biochemical and clinical imaging response. Uh, this is work from Mike Sathke's group in South uh, Africa. Uh, this patient cohort data was actually um, published in the European Journal of Molecular Imaging um, in the last month. And certainly this is another area of potential use moving forward. Of course, the toxicity profile, both short and long-term of actinium-225 is still being evaluated. A lot of these patients develop fairly significant xerostomia and um, the longer term follow-up um, remains to be performed. But in single site studies so far, this is obviously looking extremely uh, interesting and important. This is uh, just a small glimpse of the clinical trials which are ongoing at the moment with gallium-68 based peptides as theranostics in oncology clinical trials. And you can see there's a broader range of peptides against a range of different targets expressed on um, both solid tumours and lymphomas that are currently being evaluated. And over the next um, uh, one to two years, we're going to be seeing increasing numbers of these studies uh, progressing into both beta and alpha emitting therapeutics. So the field is really exploding in this space. Uh, but again, emphasising the importance of doing proper um, imaging-based informed dose escalation studies moving into phase two multi-center studies to acquire the data which clearly establishes both safety and efficacy uh, and in uh, cooperative as well as industry sponsored studies is really where the field is going at the moment. Apart from looking at uh, gallium 68, lutetium 177 or alpha emitting therapeutic uh, paired approaches, there is of course the opportunity to use molecular imaging and oncology drug development which is the other way in which theranostics with um, uh, molecular imaging based approaches can also be used, where you can assist in identifying the target, patient selection and drug development in ways that can make major impact on uh, the way in which drugs can be taken forward in clinical trials. Now, one of these approaches is clearly looking at uh, recombinant proteins, particularly antibodies, uh, the chart on the left shows the various forms from intact IgG down to FAB prime twos, mini bodies, FABs, down to the smaller SCFVs, nanobodies, and even AFI bodies. And if you look very carefully at the serum half-lives, it's, it's clear that the opportunity to match the appropriate um, PET radiometal, because most of these targets tend to be internalized, um, and as a consequence, radiometals provide the most accurate reflection of the concentration and uptake and retention within the tumour itself. In this context, um, as we move forward, we can then look at the different types of isotopes, so for longer half-lives, the zirconium um, or yttrium-based uh, PET traces, or for shorter half-lives, as Jason mentioned, copper-64, um, yttrium-86, or even technetium-99. Uh, 94M. This is a listing of um, only probably 12 months ago what was considered to be um, most of the clinical trials which were being conducted with um, both uh, radiohalide and radiometal based um, antibodies or antibody fragments. But in fact, even in the 2018, this list has probably more than doubled. We're going from some of the classic um, uh, glycoprotein-based cell surface peptides uh, at, which are expressed in both solid tumours and in hematologic malignancy through to more recently microenvironment targets where looking at immune checkpoints such as PD-1, PD-L1 and VEGFA have become much more uh, common and in fact with the um, huge explosion of immunotherapy um, there's significant opportunities for us in nuclear medicine to be able to assist with the development of second and third generation uh, PD-1, pd one inhibitors. Uh, the trastuzumab experience looking at HER2 expression by the Netherlands group is a, an example of how you can actually use uh, PET-based imaging to inform on the heterogeneity of expression 
of the particular target within an individual patient. You can see in this particular image the FDG scan of a patient with metastatic breast cancer showing particularly um, right cervical and mediastinal disease, uh, which is shown also here with the um, zirconium-89 uh, trastuzumab labelled um, infusion. And again, in this patient with uh, bony disease, um, illustrating the HER2 expression uh, and impact on management, which can occur in that context. And even classic targets that we've known for many years, such as um, carbonic anhydrase 9 or CA9 or the G250 antigen, where uh, after its discovery and characterization at Memorial Sloan Kettering and an antibody called G250 developed and a very large study with I124 G250 conducted, uh, and this is an example of an image that we've performed looking at a whole body CT, um, the I124 G250 showing localization in tumor um, of this patient with clear cell renal cancer. Um, the slow but definitive um, uptake within the cancer cell through internalization has meant that there is in fact um, zirconium-89 girintuximab studies underway at the moment. So moving towards radiometals from radiohalides is becoming more and more common, even for those targets which are predominantly cell surface expressed and have only very slow internalization characteristics. One of the other areas that's um, become um, very um, important and also showing significant therapeutic responses is by linking not just isotopes, but drugs to antibodies using the same principles that we do with isotopes where linkers are used for um, enabling highly toxic molecules which work on tubulin or DNA or polymerases to the antibody, you can in fact um, allow the delivery of the drug to the cancer, to the cancer cells and into the cells themselves. An example that you see here on the right hand side in um, parts C, D and E is a patient who had very small volume metastatic colon cancer infused with an indium labeled antibody called human 3 s 193 against a, glyco, uh, a carbohydrate antigen called Lewis Y. On the left hand side A and B, the same patient two years later who had by that stage a very large tumor in the liver was infused with an antibody drug conjugate based on this same antibody. Uh, but where after an addition of the drug to the antibody and a biodistribution study was performed, we were able to show that there was virtually no uptake of the antibody in the tumour, but most of it went to the liver. And in this context, we could show that the biodisposition of this antibody drug conjugate had altered so much that the reticular endothelial system of the liver was taking up most of the antibody on first pass. And so by using this imaging approach, and this is now being done uh, at our site and in many others, and zirconium-89, you can actually tell in your first in-human study if the new drug compound is um, going to have the properties that you want to take it into phase two trials, or if in fact you need to start again, look at your drug antibody ratio, um, your charge of molecule, and redevelop again. And because of that, a large number of the big pharmaceutical and biotech companies are using uh, zirconium-89 copper-64 based imaging studies to inform their very early phase trial um, design. Now immune checkpoint inhibitors have become um, hot topics, they're in the news, um, patients are showing dramatic responses in a number of different tumour types and this particular slide which comes from a, a very nice review published in Science this year shows the broad number of indications and approvals that have occurred even just in the last two years for a range of different uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors against CTLA-4, PD-1 and pd one There is a number of ways in which molecular imaging can be used to image the tumour microenvironment from an immune perspective, both by looking at zirconium-89 labelled antibodies through to looking at um, imaging of um, modified CAR T cells with copper 64 or zirconium 89 and even more recently being able to look at activated um, CD4 or CD8 cells uh, and macrophages with a range of different PET based approaches. 
An example of that is this particular immune checkpoint against B7H3, which is similar to PD-1 and pd one a break on the immune system, and where an antibody that we've worked on labeled with zirconium-89 was able to be imaged and reflecting the immune checkpoint and predictive of dose response uh, in a mouse model and which is extending into human. By doing these studies, we can not only validate the approach and take them into patients, but we can also then use them for um, indication of the likelihood of activation of intrinsic uh, immune cells within the body, as well as enhancing the selection of dose and patients uh, as part of this development process. Um, one of the more exciting ways in which um, the molecular imaging approach with PET-based radiometals has been um, recently reported is in looking at the imaging of activated CD8 cells with a mini body. Uh, and this slide based on data which was published in Cancer Research in 2016 shows how you can actually image T cells which can traffic into tumours at very, very small concentrations. And at the recent SNMMI meeting, the very first in human trial of this anti-human CD8 uh, imaging minibody labelled with zirconium-89 was presented by the Memorial Group and Jason and his group were involved with developing the zirconium-89 labelling of that very important compound, which I think is going to play a major role in understanding the immunobiology of immune checkpoint therapy, particularly as combination approaches for enhancing immune response and changing cold tumours into hot tumours will become available. And finally, it's not just in cancer that radiometal theranostics can potentially be used. And some work that we've been doing more recently looking at uh, imaging of activated platelets with a single chain uh, against GP2B3A, uh, labelled with copper 64, shows with exquisite um, sensitivity and accuracy the presence of a clot that was pres present within this particular carotid artery of this mouse, which you can see also on the right-hand side, raises the possibility to enhance our ability to detect thrombotic disease, but also attach other therapeutics to the single chain uh, as part of a, a theranostic strategy. So I guess just in summary, uh, and, and echoing the comments that Jason had made, theranostic imaging has become increasingly important, not just in preclinical development and in scientific understanding of the biology of various diseases, but also in therapeutic approaches, both by paired uh, radionuclide imaging and therapy, but also in identifying um, the biologic properties of disease in which you can guide patient selection, drug development, uh, and therapeutic use. So with that, uh, I'll conclude and uh, pass back over to our IBA colleagues. Okay, so we are back again to IBA. We're going to have a five-minute presentation. So first of all, we're going to thank you, Dr. Scott, for his insights. Excellent presentation. We have learned a lot, as always, with you, Dr. Scott. Uh, we have a five-minute presentation from IBA, as I said from the beginning. And after the presentation, we're going to have the, the Q&A session, okay? Just hold on for five more minutes to have your questions answered. So I'm gonna give the, the floor to Sami, our product manager. Hello, hello, um, hello everyone. Thanks a lot for those uh, very interesting presentation. So as Christian has said, I'm Sami and work for IBS product manager for the Cyclotube, and I will take uh, the opportunity of this webinar to introduce the latest Cyclotube that was developed by IBA and our solutions for uh, radio metals production. So in a cyclotron world where all designs were more than 20 years old, it was about time to come with uh, something new, uh, which is why IBA introduced the Cyclone Cube about uh, two years ago on the market. So the three claims, uh, the three claims that we had in mind when we developed the Cyclone Cube, are that it should be able to deliver, it should be able, to, uh, it should be designed forever. Indeed, the relationship that you will build with your cyclotron will last, and this is why it also has to be designed uh, for you. Design to deliver, a simple design, simple operation, and yet capable of reaching high production capacity. With up to 300 microamp, the Cyclone Cube is today the only cyclotron with internal ion source that is capable of delivering such high current and therefore uh, such big amount of activity. 
the second cube was also designed to be evolutive. As the market demand grows, your production will, will need to grow accordingly. With two versions in self-shielding and four different versions in his, if installed in a vault, the cyclone cube can be easily upgraded to a, to a, more, uh, to a higher version. In its highest configuration, uh, the cyclone cube will allow to reach a production capacity of 30 queries of F18 in two hours. Finally, it has been designed for you with these eight exit ports allowing full flexibility in the radio isotope that you want to produce. From the traditional F18, ammonia, carbon 11, or 15, the cyclone cube can also be equipped to produce gallium 68, copper 64, zirconium 89. Um, we have recently announced a brand new feature of the cyclone cube, which is particularly interesting in the context of this webinar on radiometals and gallium, copper, and zirconium production. Indeed, even if F18 is a perfect energy for high yield production of F18, the ideal energy for copper, gallium, and zirconium production is usually around 13 to 15 MeV in order to avoid the co-production of impurities. The traditional method to degrade the energy is to use a foil degrader, but it will dissipate a lot of heat and limit the current on the target. Thanks to the custom energy, two of the eight exit ports of the cyclone tube can be equipped with a special setup that allow you to extract the energy directly at 13 or 15, MeG, uh, 15 MeV without any energy degrader. It will therefore be possible to produce a maximized quantity of radiometals with high purity levels. Now let's have a look at the production of those isotopes. There is a novel and very elegant way of producing radiometals in liquid targets, and we've seen now in congresses and scientific publications that it benefits for increasing uh, popularity. IBM and the University of Coimbra have been pioneering in that development, and it is now possible to produce gallium-68 with a cyclotron in the same way FDG is produced. We basically load the target with a liquid, irradiate, transfer the liquid to a hot cell where we can purify, and then obtain gallium chloride in the exact same form that it would be obtained from a generator. Further processing can be done using a Sintra or even gold kit to obtain gallium PSMA or DOTA 8 or DOTA 9. The process is fully automated and can be repeated several times per day, just like for FDG. On the regulatory side, the draft of the European Pharmacopeia giving the guidelines for the gallium-68 produ produced with a cyclotron has been published and is now open for public consultation. As it is now, the quality of the gallium chloride obtained with the IBA solution is perfectly compliant with those criteria over the entire shelf life of the products. The very same process can be mimicked for copper-64 or copper-61 with the irradiation of the liquids, automatic transfer to the hot cell, and purification. Let's now have a look at the solid target solution we offer. Once again, we want to propose a full solution from the irradiation to the final product. We also want to offer a solution that fits everyone's needs. This is why we recently announced two new solid targets design. We now have three targets in our catalogs and each target has a defined current acceptance or power rating, which will directly define the amount of activity that you can obtain with the different isotope. So we have an automated process for uh, iodine. I will, I will skip that part. And uh, I will go directly to the copper production. Uh, so we have a special module that make the, the target disc. So it's a nickel plating that is made on the baking with, by uh, electro deposition. Once the target is ready, we can insert it in the targets, irradiate it, and then transfer it to the, to the hot cell where we have the processing module. The processing module, or the so-called pink data, is our reference module for the radiometal extraction. After irradiation, the coin is inserted in the module and is dissolved with an acid. The recovered solution is then purified to remove any kind of impurities. The labeling can then be done either manually or with a syndra. For the zirconium, the same, the same process can be applied. The only difference is that we just need one foil of natural yttrium that is clamped on the target disk. For the rest, it's all the same. We radiate, we transfer the coin to the hot cell, and we use the pink tana module for the extraction of uh, the zirconium. Um, so I think that's about it for me. Uh, we are always looking into the development of solutions for other radio isotope that than the one that I described in the, in the presentation, presentation here. here. And I'm uh, and thinking I'm, with Cadium 44 I'm here. We usually here. work with collaboration with our customers. So we have seen that this way was actually a very fruitful and uh, optimal way to, to collaborate. So if you have um, any, any question or any will to, to collaborate with us, 
feel free to do, to uh, contact us. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Sami, for this nice presentation. I, you can always ask us questions through emails. Okay. Uh, now we're gonna go to the Q and A session. We are running out of time. It's already three thirty. Uh, very late to Dr. Scott. So we have selected a few questions, and Dr. Scott and Dr. Jason Lewis, we answered these questions. Let me first of all answer a question that's coming up all the time. Are we going to share to make the presentation available? Yes, the presentation will be made available. You're going to receive an email if you have it registered in a few weeks with the presentation and a few more questions that we're going to be able to answer. So I think I, I answer the question everybody wants to know. So I'm gonna go to, first of all, to question number one. We have to select a few of them only. We don't have time for, for all of them, but thank you very much already for your excellent questions. The first question is, is that a problem to have a mix of copper 60 and copper 64? This is for both of you, Dr. Lewis first, and then Dr. Scott. Um, no, not really. And the reason I say that is that copper 64 has the 12.7 hour half-life, copper 60 is a 20 minute half-life. So as long as you wait just a few hours, the copper 60 will be gone from the copper 64. However, when you do make copper 64, there are other isotopes, cobalt and nickel isotopes, that you need to make sure that you do remove from that copper 64 process as much as possible. If it's impossible to remove all of those, you may have to consider those isotopes in terms of their dose symmetry in the biological system. But the copper 60 and copper 64, no, because the six will be gone in a pretty short period of time. Uh, Dr. Scott, do you have any, any further comment or your view, any other thing to no, add? I, I, agree. I, I agree with Jason. Um, not so much with the copper 64 and copper 60, but I, I would um, also support his comment that depending on any other um, uh, metal which may be present, it might impact on your labeling uh, efficiency and, and specific activity. So uh, I think those are more issues than, than the 64 and the 60 together. Okay, so let's go to the second question now. So I'm gonna do, do now first Dr. Scott, I'll alternate like this, and then Dr. Luce. So Dr. Scott, can you comment on the use of copper, copper 64 in antibodies, your view? So I think that the use of copper 64 with intact antibodies would be very much restricted to scenarios where you're looking at an immediate um, binding of the antibody to the target. So probably in hemologic malignancy or uh, where you have an easily accessible microenvironment target. Uh, if it's against a, um, a target which is expressed on the surface of cancer cells, where typically with an intact antibody you'll need three, four, five days at least in order to get adequate penetrance uh, and uptake and clearance from blood, um, then clearly copper 64 would not be suitable in that context. Okay. Any further com comments, Dr. Lewis? Uh, Andrew is completely correct. Um, the only, I did mention in my talk, pre-targeting concepts, and you could use a copper 64 small, mole small molecule for looking at an antibody. But in terms of copper 64 directly on the antibody, I completely agree with Andrew. Okay, thank you very much. I think that answered the question. That clarifies, you know, because some people think that you can use copper 64 as much as you can use your zirconium 89. Question number three is going out to Dr. Lewis first, and I like that one very much. How do we close the gap between the leading academic centers like Germany and Australia and the actual availability of licensed drugs? With the exception of Lutatera, most patients are not benefiting it. <laughs> and I had a similar question in that sense as well, so I found it very interesting as a question to you too. If I, if I knew the answer to that, I could probably, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I would make some investments. Um, it's, it's an absolute challenge, um, and I think um, the, the two ways to solve this are patient advocacy. I do think that, um, especially in the States, and I'm not sure what it's like in Europe, but patient advocate groups, the reason why Lutathera has done so well and is getting used widely, I think it's because the patient advocacy groups have been behind that. So I think that's one, but I also think it gets down to fundamental training. Um, in the States and other places, the nuclear medicine physician is responsible for the radioactive drug and there are, the med oncologist may not um, have particular training in that so that the patient may get change from one discipline to the other. I think we need to start training medical oncologists with training in nuclear medicine and vice versa. So that in, in 
they, they can appreciate both sides of that. I think we also need to go back and look at the lessons of, of uh, Zevelin and Bexar. And there were some very interesting surveys done on why it wasn't adopted because there were some perceptions about cost and everything else. And I think we need to go back and really learn those lessons and try not to repeat the same mistakes. But it's an incredibly complex issue. And that's just three things that came to the top of my head. I, I, I imagine Andrew may have some more. <clears throat> yeah, so, so I completely agree with what Jason said. I, I, I would also um, reiterate that patient advocacy is, is something that in nuclear medicine we've not always done, um, used particularly well, but which certainly in the context of oncology can be tremendously powerful from a political perspective. And because in most of our countries we need to get government approvals uh, either from a regulatory or from a funding perspective, um, that can be incredibly powerful. Um, a, a few other comments that I would make. First is that I do think that we have uh, a significant challenge ahead of us to ensure that we're all um, sufficiently trained to be able to perform diagnostic and um, radionuclide-based therapy across the broad new areas that are coming uh, into play. And so for our training of new uh, young nuclear medicine physicians, the training of chemists, the training of our physicists. Uh, there is a whole new generation of people that need to be brought up to speed very quickly, as well as recredentialing existing people. Uh, so I think that's an important component. I also think that uh, uh, evidence-based trials are incredibly important. We've mm. never had to do this as a specialty as much in the past. But the reality is that we need to be able to do evidence-based trials in order to take these molecules forward. Some companies are in a position to do that. Uh, otherwise, investigator-initiated studies, which occur in most other medical specialties, are the wave of the future. So cooperative groups um, are being developed, uh, certainly in Australia, they're very prominent, and in Europe and in US, they are emerging as well. So that investigator-initiated phase two multi-set of studies are going to be required and done properly if the broader way of opportunities that we have are going to be uh, fully uh, exploited. Excellent, thank you. Thank you so much. I, I definitely agree with you both, actually. I have a very last question because you really ran out of time. So as I said, after we can answer a few questions uh, through email, okay? in a few weeks. So the last question is, any examples of injections with cocktail of different energy therapy radionuclides, like lutetium PSMA, uh, lutetium-177, and yttrium-90 PSMA, depending on the size and shape of the tumor? Do you have any examples? And also actinium and lutetium cocktails, I would say. So, um, preclinically, yes. I mean, people have been talking about for a long time that um, a, a patient's tumors aren't just perfectly spherical one centimeter tumor. Um, they can be anything from a few cells to large masses. And so something like yttrium 90 might be better for the bigger masses and the beta emitter for the smaller masses. Um, I, I can think of examples where this has been done in a preclinical setting, but I honestly can't think of anything clinically. Um, and Andrew may may have a, um, a different spin there, but I can't think of any. But I, I think it's it's an exciting and interesting idea. I think the logistical challenges are huge because not every patient and their tumor burden are going to be created equal. So do you do it personalized in a way that you think that some of these tumors would be better with yttrium and some of the tumors would be better with lutetium and you mix different amounts of cocktail depending on that? Um, I don't know. I think there's some very difficult logistical technical challenges to doing that. But I think it's a fascinating and interesting idea. Uh, Dr. Andrews, anything to add? And I, I'm also adding the cocktail of lutetium and actinium that it was discussed during the last s &M, So that's part of the question as well. So I think one of the fundamental issues is um, as we're moving forward with developing these new therapies, we have to recognize that um, oncologic development does require us to address uh, from a regulatory as well as from a clinician viewpoint, the safety profile as well as optimal dosing schedules of any individual therapeutic. And if we're going to be combining them together, we need to be able to understand the safety and toxicity of each individually, um, as well as combining them together uh, before we can really look at therapeutic um, outcomes. So I think it's going to be challenging for us to be able to do these in um, 
proper prospective study. So I am familiar with uh, a number of protocols which have been using combinations of lutetium-177 and yttrium-90 based um, peptide therapies. Uh, these are all small number. Um, they haven't been to maximum tolerated dose. And so it's really anecdotal, I think, uh, whether or not clinical benefit will be seen. Um, and, and so whether or not you're going to be combining two beta emitters together or a beta and an alpha, um, I think it's going to be very challenging from a clinical trial design and regulatory perspective to be able to identify therapeutic benefit unless you're prepared to do very large multi-center studies to tease out the differences between the two. Uh, but we may see that in the future. Okay, thank you so much for your insights. I definitely agree. It has to be approved. I mean, we can play around with cocktails, but then we have the regulatory aspect to take into account. So I thank you so much for your questions, your your answers and your insights. We, we are reaching the end of the webinar. I would just would like to, I'm putting, we're putting on the screen, IBA will be exhibiting at DNM. We're going to be at booth 37. And we'd like to invite you for the learn and talk sessions on the PSMA-based radio pharmaceuticals for imaging and therapy. It's on the screen. We have Dr. Kramer and Dr. Gizzo, and also Sami gave a presentation on the IBA equipment. So the presentation will be around 9.45 and 8, 11.30. You can register. The registration, you can see down at the bottom, register at DNM IBA events. And you can also tweet uh, and go and see our tweet, IBA Twitter, okay? And also follow us on LinkedIn. We're putting everything in LinkedIn. Okay, I thank you again for your time. I thank you for the speakers, for the excellent presentation and their insights and the answer to the questions. I thank the whole audience. It's late for some of you. It's very early for others. Thank you so much. And on behalf of IBA, we thank you again. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.